I decided to become a journalist um, because I wasn't fit for anything else. <laughs> no, uh, the real reason I decided to become a journalist because I, I grew up steeped in words and my father was an actor, my uncle John B was a writer, my mother was a teacher of English. There was a great reverence uh, for the English language. And I was also just a very curious person and interested in history, interested in the world around me and always wanting to know what was behind things. Um, so I think curiosity was what drove me eventually and, and obviously a love of the, the English language. Um, I was very conscious as well, of course, that my uncle, as well as being a playwright, John B, was a prolific newspaper columnist. So he wrote for the Evening Herald in Dublin. He wrote a column for the Limerick Leader newspaper. And of course, it was the Leader where I got my own journalistic start, thanks to John B, who uh, rang up the owners and arranged for me and him to go to Ballybunion, have a pint with them, maybe two, I'd say even three. And uh, they really, um, over the sh course of an hour, formed a very sound judgment of my capacity to hold my drink. Something that didn't always last, I have to say, but at the time they felt I could be safely let loose uh, upon Limerick um, as a cub reporter. And I started there on the 17th of September, 1979. And it was the best training imaginable uh, for an impressionable young man from Cork. A huge jump from Limerick to Rwanda. And um, I would say one thing is that the ideas and the themes which would inform my journalism, whether it was in in Rwanda, whether it was in the Middle East, whether it was in the Balkans, all, all begin in the newsroom of the Limerick Leader. And I'll, I'll give you an example. About two weeks after I got to the Leader, I was sent down stairs to the front office and I was told that there were four Nigerian students uh, who wanted to speak to a reporter. And they were studying at what was then the NIHE, what would become the University of Limerick. And they told me that they'd been refused admission to the Savoy Hotel in Limerick, uh, the, to a nightclub at the Savoy. Uh, because they were black and I went down with a photographer the following Friday night and we discovered it was true. We heard a, a doorman saying the blacks aren't allowed here. And so it became a huge story in the leader and I'll always remember the courage of the editor at the time, a man called Brendan Halligan, for running that story. You know, it wasn't an easy thing to do. The Savoy were big advertisers on the leader and um, a lot of uh, people in Limerick, you know, might have felt that this was, you know, bringing bad news to Limerick, giving the city a bad image. Um, but Halligan pushed on with it and he gave the story a great front page billing. Eventually, the Irish Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Nigerian ambassador, all became involved in it and the Savoy ended up apologising to the students. Now, I tell that story in relation to Rwanda uh, because it involved a certain degree of journalistic moral courage, certainly on the part of the editor. In Rwanda, courage was required as well. It was different kind of courage. So there was physical courage and then there was a psychological courage uh, to face into an appallingly dark and haunting uh, scenario where you had perhaps as many as 800,000 people butchered in the process of course of 100 days much of the killing done by their neighbours with machetes and clubs. When you arrived into that as a journalist, how, how could you possibly make sense of it? Um, and there was a great physical danger, of course, because especially when you were travelling in the parts of the country uh, that were controlled by the killers or where they were still hiding out, uh, there was the, the, the danger of ambush. And having seen what they'd done to other people, I was absolutely terrified. So I didn't... Um, I didn't know what I was letting myself in for when I went to Rwanda. Um, I didn't know that it was something that would live with me until the present day. A place that would haunt me and will always haunt me. How could it not? Um, when you see people brutalised and butchered in that kind of way, it just stays with you. There's no, there's no way of, um, of shutting it out. And of course it has informed me uh, uh, and the way I see the world ever since. Um, whenever I see people being singled out because of their race, and this goes back to, to Limerick, what I began talking about, what I, whenever I see people uh, being singled out because of their religion, um, 
And whenever any leader uses language that is characterized by its hatred, that seeks to make human beings into something other than the beauty of the human person, then I get very, very worried. And it's the memory of Rwanda. Because ultimately, when you dehumanize, when you other people, you're on the road to rendering them less than human. And when they become that, they become so much easier to destroy. Hotspots. I'm trying to think. Um, I've been to many, many hotspots, so many I don't even want to think about it. I guess there has hardly been a war in the last 25 years that uh, a major war that I haven't covered. So the, obviously you've got Afghanistan, Iraq, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, the, the Kosovo War, the Rwandan genocide, the violence in the South African townships, Algeria during the Civil War, Colombia during the Civil War. Um, so many. I get weary even saying it, uh, and that's, that I haven't even begun. Yemen was a, a recent uh, war that I went to. I'm about to go to the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's why I'm not here with you. And you can hear bangs in the background. That's fireworks. And how nice that is. How nice to know. I can see the lights flashing. How nice to know that that's not gone far. Because always when I'm around gone far, I am um, shelling or airstrikes. I know that it's there to kill. It's there to do harm to human beings. And so uh, you can never detach from the noise of explosions or bullets. Uh, they are inhuman, but bent on human destruction. And um, hotspots, my God. Yes, um, and shelled, sniped out, ambushed, um, caught in all kinds of messes. Um, but you come out of it, you survive it, and you go on. I've met uh, a lot of interesting people. I'm, I'm wary of the the idea of just being paying attention to the famous people I've met, because often I've met famous people and they've been the biggest bores you could imagine, because they're so busy being famous. You know, they've forgotten who they really are, or they've had to develop this kind of image, this persona. Uh, which is one which has been created for them by the media or that they've been complicit in creating with the media. And um, you could be digging for a hundred years and you'd never get near the real person because I think they've probably forgotten it themselves. Um, it's particularly true of celebrities, but I'm lucky I work in a, in a part of journalism that has nothing to do with celebrity. I avoid them like the plague. Um, the most interesting famous person I've ever met was Nelson Mandela. And that there's a real, he's the real deal, Mandela. He, you know what I always remember about him was you would go to, to visit a hospital with him or, you know, a factory. And the first people he would seek out and go and say hello to, you know, you'd walk in and everybody was lined up. And he would seek out the cleaning ladies or the janitors. And he'd spend time with them. He didn't care about the the big shots who were there in their suits. It was the small people he cared about. And um, I took a lot of inspiration from that. I, in my journalism, I have been much less interested in what the politicians say and do than I have um, in, in what we mistakenly call ordinary people because they're not that extraordinary. The kind of people that I meet in war zones have an ingenuity, a creativity, a determination, uh, which only comes from knowing that if you don't keep going, you're going to die and your family's going to die. 
these are people who have lost everything else but hold on to their lives. And I'm very, um, I'm moved by the memory of those people, whether it's in a village in Rakhine State or a Rohingya village in Rakhine State, um, surrounded by enemies, or it's in a little makeshift shelter in Rwanda where a child who's been <coughs> you know, beaten, macheted, whose hand is rotting away, whom I believe is uh, convinced is going to die, Valentina, visitor of Aguaya, is her name. She's actually the nicest person I've ever met, the most amazing, most fantastic person I've ever met. Sorry, Nelson, who is great, but Valentina, and who came out of that experience at the age of 12, and, uh, and who's now a mother and a social worker living in the United States. Katie was traumatized. She could barely speak when I first came across her. And I've watched that progress. And that is about the resilience of, of humanity, the beautiful things in us. I have been affected by my work. Um, we can hear the fireworks going off in the background. Now, if I didn't know, if I couldn't see the lights flashing outside there, I wouldn't know that there were fireworks. Um, or if I didn't know what day it was, it's a fireworky time of year in England. Then I would be, uh, I would have jumped, you know? Uh, so I carry that residual, what they call hypervigilance, uh, as a result of being exposed to a lot of gunfire, a lot of shelling. Um, and I've been affected in terms of nightmares and what they call post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I was calculating, you know, the average soldier, um, you know, who spends maybe five to ten years in the army in this part of the world is only going to um, is only going to spend maybe a year of that in combat. Um, whereas, if you're a foreign correspondent, year after year after year after year, you're going into conflict zones. So it does have a wearing effect on you, of course it does. And you've got to fight that hard. Fight that hard. Make sure you don't fall into drinking or drugs to deal with it. Um, that you have another life which has plenty of joy. Plenty of joy. It's absolutely vital. Trump. What can I say? I'm, you know, I'm always reluctant to talk about him for fear of giving him more attention or notice, because that's what he's after, notice. Um, and Rocketman, his pal in Pyongyang. What struck me is that they need each other. They really need each other. And uh, it suits both of them to be able to rant and rave and look tough. Now, I'm going to put my neck on the line here and say I don't believe they're going to cause a nuclear war because I think they're both bluffers and bullies. Um, and I think the huge difference is Trump is still constrained by the American people and by the generals around him who know exactly what would happen uh, if there was to be a nuclear war. Destruction of South Korea and all the American troops there apart from the civilians of South Korea. Uh, and contamination as far away as Japan and parts of China. So I think there are strong domestic forces, strong regional forces like the Chinese, who would be pushing, pushing to make sure that this doesn't escalate into a nuclear conflict. We can't be so confident about uh, Kim Jong Il, but again, his primary concern, you have to remember, is survival. He does not want to be destroyed. That's what all of the nuclear weapons, um, you know, build up is about, is making sure he's not destroyed himself. So therefore it makes absolutely no sense to get involved in a nuclear conflict where the one absolute guarantee would be his own destruction. So I'm not sanguine, but I do believe we shouldn't panic and we shouldn't get into um, a kind of spiral of fear because of this.